okay, I want to set the record straight. No one knows Frank Zane. They mm. still talk about Arnold. Um, Arnold had already transcended that by a long shot. Mm. So why does he come back? And like yeah. Ken Sprague he said, he goes, I think that Joe Weider lived vicariously through Mike. You know, they both yeah. wore the glasses. Mm. They both had the mustache. The oh, tenor okay. in the gym after Arnold won was, uh, you know, very tense. You know, Weider, like I said, Weider didn't sell the steak. He sold the sizzle around the steak. <laughs> yeah. And that's what made Arthur Jones a genius is let me get the genetic freaks to say they use my equipment and people will believe. And then the most important part, I was there. Uh, okay, I just want to welcome everybody to my first interview of the channel. We're extremely honored and privileged to have Mark Martinez here today. How are you, Mark? Good, good. How are you doing, Sean? Thank you for being up so early and accommodating my schedule. Uh, bright and early is the way I like it. So with your new fantastic film, I, I've absolutely loved it, and I don't think you can call yourself a fan of the Golden Era if you haven't seen this film yet. How's the reception of the film been otherwise? Yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to gauge. I'm just uh, definitely on social media. I've seen a lot more uh, uh, response than ever before, which uh, in, in large part is driven by you and your review and the response you've, you've given, as well as people that have followed me through the journey through the years where they've, you know, with, whether they've been on the bodybuilding forums or friends of mine that, that have said, you know, it's coming, it's coming soon. He's trying to get a distributor. It's been that for the better part of at least the last year in terms of finding distribution. So it seems like it's picked up. And in terms of response from the streaming channels, I don't think I'll find out for at the earliest three months, because that's when they do their quarterly reports. And then I'll see some sort of feedback on that. But um, in terms of just a gut level bodybuilding fan response, uh, um, I'm very happy. Oh, that's great. Yeah, excellent to hear. So I noticed that with the film, you know, you combined your passions of being a bodybuilder and a filmmaker. So can you tell everybody a little bit about your history of being a bodybuilder and what led you to film and, and a bigger picture, what kind of inspired you to tackle such a huge project such as this? Sure. Um, um, first off, I think, I mean, I think like a lot of, uh, a lot of people, they fall in love with movies early on. I definitely did. I think from the time I was a kid, saw the good and the bad and the ugly in the theater starring Clint okay. Eastwood. Uh, you know, it just seemed like magic, you know, films. And I loved how film romanticized everything on the screen. The person who did the illustrations for me in the film, oh, as well as... They were fantastic. Yeah, he's an incredible art. artist. Yeah, we've been best mm. friends since we were eight years old. And he also co-wrote the bulk of the soundtrack. You know, him and I, we grew up, we, we loved making like little eight millimeter films. So that was, <laughs> that was kind of always in, in the back of my mind. In terms of bodybuilding, you know, like in, in the movie, uh, you, get to, you get to that age where, where um, you know, you're trying to form your identity and then you hit a bump in the road. And then you just, you, you're, for me anyway, the default reaction was I'm not enough. I've got to do something else to fortify because I faced rejection. So obviously, you know, when you look in the mirror and you're like, you know, five foot four, 112 pound, 13 year old, you know, so, um, and then you see the comic book ad, you know, in the back of the magazines and, you know, uh, borrowed some, some weights from, from uh, my mom's uncle. He had like a 110 pound set of iron weights and I'm out in the garage, you know, by the dryer and the washer, you know, doing, you know, high rep squats and curls and pressing. <laughs> It, you know, and then at that age, right? I mean, 13, 14, 15, that's when, you know, who can run the fastest, who can jump the highest, who can lift the most. And then my freshman year in high school, one of my buddies on the high school uh, football team, American football. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, because I know you guys play really football. different. Yeah. <laughs> yeah and, uh, um, you know, he brought the book Pumping Iron to school. And it just, mm. this is 1975. 74 75 and at that point in time there weren't that many bodybuilders i mean you, you, you know you just didn't see it so yes. that i think that lit, lit a fire and then it kind of was a slow burn for a couple years but that was kind of like the initial i guess uh convergence of my of uh of thinking about it you know you you had those two interests and what was the bigger interest perhaps or the uh, inspiration in tackling the film oh well so um you know, a few years later, like in 1977, I, I joined Golds, and there, there was only one of them that was that, mm. that was it. This was before 
um, anything. I think a lot, it's, it's, it, I always try, I was trying to speak to someone who was not a, a bodybuilding fan, but they were a, 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 like a cultural fan in terms of just, mm. you know, California culture. And I was trying to explain the impact of, of Gold's Gym on our culture and our society to not, you know, not only America, but the world. And I said, it's kind mm. of like, think of hairstyles and clothing and social mores in this country before the Beatles and then after. Mm -hmm. If you weren't there before, you just take what came after for granted. Like there yeah. now, you know, guys, that will, you know, there's how many different types of gyms men and women can walk into uh, yeah. a city row or a CrossFit gym or a UFC gym or, a, you know, you know, hardcore bodybuilding gyms are now the, well, they've always been rare, but rarer than before. There's how many different fitness change. I mean, it's all over. And then back in mm -hmm. those days, it was, it was um, nothing. But I think once I joined, lived that for a bit, um, got some distance from it. You know, I went, I went to, uh, to school, uh, finished my college education, got started my career uh, in broadcast television and was in it for well over 10 years. I, you know, I started like in 1987 in broadcast television. And I think it was probably the late 90s to early 2000s when I kind of revisit the internet just to check up on what has happened to the world of bodybuilding because I yeah. you know, left that part of my life so far in the past. And seeing people post things that were totally inaccurate, totally mm. untrue, flat out lies. Some of it was innocent. Some of them was just conjecture like, oh, I think maybe this happened. Or then there's other people that were there and know better, but try and with an agenda, drive it in a different direction. One, I know how to handle a camera, lighting. I know how to edit. I know how to do visual effects. I could do all those jobs. It's probably going to take me longer than if I had money to hire a crew to do all those jobs. And then the most important part, I was there. You know, I was there at that time. So I'm like, I'll combine my skill set from from my broadcast career with my personal life experience of of being there, and and tr and then reach out of you know out of the past and try and reconnect with with guys and see if they were willing to do this. So I think that was it. It was like looking at stuff on the internet and it's like, wait a minute, that didn't happen. That way. <laughs> uh, you know? And so, and, and part of it, I, you know, I wrote in that blog, not so flattering uh, aspects of my personality, kind, kind of like a know, a know it all, but just, just like a stickler for detail, but for detail. And, and so yes. I think that was, yeah, I'm like, Hey, I want to set the record straight. And even in the magazines, the narrative had been driven in, in a, different direction yeah yeah i know that's something i also worry about my own content sometimes because i was never there and i have to rely on these external sources and all the compilation right. of material you wonder how much of it is just conjecture how much of it is chinese whispers how much it is distortion and lies and as randy roach puts it like smoke and mirrors as well because like you yes. said agendas <laughs> it's always like on the back of my mind about like what i'm saying i'm just a storyteller i'm not really a historian so i trust guys like you more than ever yes. you know your fantastic film uh, it's completely eye-opening. Um, you know, speaking to that, for the people that weren't there, there seems to be a tremendous resurgence in uh, the interest of the golden era at the moment, especially in the last 10 to 15 years. Uh, why do you think that golden era bodybuilding is receiving so much popularity again? Uh, there could be many factors. I mean, I can't get inside someone else's head, but I would think that maybe the way the top pros look now, I don't I don't think a lot of people like to to look like that. They might mm -hmm. admire the amount of training that it goes into or the dedication, which has always been part of, of the game. I think maybe they say, well, look at the golden era. Look at, you know, these these guys were plausibly, they looked really athletic. They looked healthy. Mm. Um, and most of them did come from other physical activities. You know, they weren't just straight. Exactly. I think that kind of like has a, a determinant in how your physique does look if you've done some sort mm. of sport beforehand. It's just a yes. totally different yeah. look. I wonder if enough time has passed in whatever the pursuit is, whether it's uh, music um, you know, literature, uh, bodybuilding, uh, automobile racing, anything. People after a certain point in time ago, oh, let's look back at this era. Yeah, your YouTube channel. So what do you see trend-wise when people started asking questions or maybe requesting content? What do you feel? Featuring some of the golden era content is what's attracted a lot of my initial audience because I am a new, new person and uh, I get a large amount of people i think responding in the comments uh you know they're a little bit older and are actually kind of of that period so they're looking back at it maybe with some rose tinted nostalgia right. but then there's also a lot of the younger guys as well who you know might have heard different things and, and they 
you know, in their comments, they almost are looking for clarification or, you know, just an introduction to the content. So I think it's, you know, it's great. I think what we're doing because we're serving that kind of, um, you know, range of or spectrum of audience. So it's good. But, um, you know, in, in asking that as well, um, you know, there was a few of the guys that weren't present in the documentary that, you know, some of the guys might, uh, some of the viewers might be thinking, oh, where were they? Such as uh, Arnold or Mike Katz, Robbie Robertson, or even Frank Zane. So can you maybe just expand on perhaps why they uh, weren't um, included in the documentary? Arnold, initially this documentary started, I was just going to focus on the 1977 Mr. America Parade. I was just mm. going to focus on my time when I joined Golds, which would have been 77 to about 1980. And in 19, actually in 1979, I was a member of both World Gym and Golds. <laughs> and when, Ken, when Ken had sold Golds in late 79, the transition mm. started to happen where um, uh, Pete and Ed and Tim, and there was a fourth guy named Denny, they were having trouble with the person who owned the building Golds was in in Santa Monica. Yes, yeah, yeah. I remember reading that, yeah. Right, exactly. So so, um, so they're like, we need to find a, a cheaper place. And they lucked out, you know, Pete, Pete had found not only a cheaper place, but a much larger place. So, and for me, being resistant to change, <laughs> uh, <laughs> oh my God, this place is really big. And it's even bigger now because I think they uh, they initially had one one what they call bay in that building and then they've opened it up where they owned almost yeah. the entire or not owned but at least leased the space immediately like quadrupled in size and got even bigger and then I think too with there was there was more people and it just it just for me just seemed like it was getting too loud and raucous uh, but this uh, world's by contrast was much quieter wasn't it like got, Joe Gold had that kind of no music policy and don't drop the weight sort of aspect right right he did yeah. uh, you know and Ken I mean Ken always had music and it, it was fine um, you know, the music was going, I think it was just the confined space, then the energy mm -hmm. in that space in Santa Monica. And I'm yes, sure people yeah. who were at the original Golds on Pacific Avenue would have said the same thing. And I, I don't doubt it. But um, so anyway, yeah, my, my initial uh, focus was going to be from 77 to 80. So I'm like, okay, well, since Arnold retired in 75, mm -hmm. and he yeah, stopped yeah. being a member of Golds in 76, because he did train in Santa Monica at Second Street mm -hmm. Gym. Then, you know, that's a whole other story. But, you know, I'm like, okay, this is the time frame I'm focusing on. Arnold's retired. I wasn't going to, to, to interview him anyway. And then when I started getting people to interview, of course, when they talked about Golds, they talked about the move from the original to Santa Monica. They talked about those mm -hmm. days. So as the timeline opened up, then I'm like, okay, then I'm going to have to try and get Arnold. I tried, uh, you know, for, mm -hmm. for a couple of years. And, you know, he's, he, and rightly so, um, has quite a few gatekeepers around him. <laughs> because, I mean, it's not, it's not only just, you know, perhaps he doesn't want to speak to it, but also uh, if he has his own projects going, uh, he's obviously going to put his, his resources and time and energy into that. You know, so, uh, you know, I would speak to two or three different people at Oak Productions, but I, I would imagine that the messages never got passed on or the emails got deleted. So he probably has no idea that this project's even out there. Yeah, Franco, Franco I got. And for people that I wanted to get because they were a part of that Second Street Golds, I tried to, you know, I, I, I tried to get Frank, um, Frank Zane, you know, didn't, didn't respond to emails. Uh, he did respond after I had... Uh, Charles Gaines contact him, but it was just a one line thing. It was like not even acknowledging participating in the documentary. It was just, oh, thank you. Tom Platts, Andreas Calling, I'm trying to think of one other person was asking if it was going to be a uh, uh, compensation financially for it, which <laughs> as an independent filmmaker, I'm like, I, you know, I, I can't. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. George, Butler, George Butler didn't pay anyone in pumping iron aside from Arnold. Uh, <laughs> and, then, and then eventually had to give. A little bit of money to some of the other guys mm -hmm. but uh you know so i wanted to get andreas i wanted to get roger callard uh roger mm -hmm. circled back to me and we've we had a couple of wonderful phone calls um but at the time that roger got back to me the film it wasn't locked but it was pretty much you know i had everything the storyline cut and i didn't really you know the uh the gentleman that helped give me seed money to get this started you know, we just didn't have any more money to devote to either me traveling or flying guys in. And, you know, because you have to fly yeah. them in, put them up at a hotel, feed them for a couple oh, of days. Because, wow. you know, Roger would have added a lot, I think, you know, from that time and place. Who else? Uh, Danny, Danny Padilla, I would have loved yeah. to have gotten. Um, yeah. He didn't respond. 
to an email. And it's kind of hard, you know, they're not going to remember a 17 year old kid or 18 year old kid. Uh, another thing Ken Sprague told me too, he says, you have to remember a lot of these guys were promised a lot of things from many people through the years. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so they're, to them, they're hearing it once again, you know, mm -hmm. that someone's got this really great project, do you want to get involved? So I think some sure. of them were, yeah, we're kind of gun shy. Two people I really wanted to get were the writers that, well, one was a fantastic bodybuilder, Rick Wayne. Mm -hmm. And the writer, he was the editor of Muscle Builder at that time. And then Jack Neary. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those two guys crafted the narrative. Weeder, like I said, Weeder didn't sell the steak. He sold the sizzle around the steak. <laughs> and uh, and Rick Wayne and Jack Neary were the by far, I think, the two best writers that define that era. And their perspectives would have been, I thought. Valuable. You know, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, yeah. I, yeah, and at some point it's like, I have limited funds. I don't have anyone running interference for me to get these guys involved. So I've got sure. to at some point move forward, you know, mm. so which is what I had to do with a lot of them. Yeah, it's fascinating. Yeah, that's it. You take the direction as it comes. Yeah, speaking to that, because I love how you included uh, acknowledgement of Vince's gym and Bill Pearl's gym as well, because they quite often uh, get a little bit for, you know, overshadowed. But why do you think there was gold? Why do you think it eventually became the Mecca as opposed to those two? I think number one was location. I just think Joe Weider, when he left New Jersey to California and then the the covers of Muscle Builder, you know, before your time and my time were Dave Draper and Zane and Arnold on the beach, right, with girls in bikinis <laughs> and selling that um, to the rest of the world. And Gold's was at the beach. You know, it was on Pacific mm. Avenue, just a, a couple blocks from from the Pacific Ocean. Uh, I think that's number one. Uh, Dick Tyler, who was one of the mm. writers of in Joe Weider's Muscle Builder, was yeah. the Rick Wayne of his day and, and fantastic. So I think, and the, the odd thing was though, because in that era, Joe Weider gave most of his publicity in his magazines to Vince. I think Vince's yeah. gym yeah. was the gym. Like I touched on the documentary, the personalities, you know, when John Balick, because John Balick worked at, Vince's gym when he first moved from yeah. um, from the Midwest and then he went and joined Gold's and he and you know you saw the contrast in personalities Vince mm. was kind of a cantankerous cranky guy <laughs> to uh, say the Joe, least <laughs> yeah Joe Joe could be too you know like like John said it's it's a place for my friends to train just like the original you know like the original Gold's was it's just mm. a place because Muscle Beach had been closed down I'm going to build this cinder block gym it's going to be very utilitarian and my mm. guys can come and train there and so I think, I think that did it. I think, and that it was, it was well known within muscle dumb, which let's face it, what was the circulation of muscle builder in the sixties mm. or the early seventies? It couldn't have been more than 10,000 pumping iron. The book helped that, that happened. I think because Ken Sprague had owned the gym by that time when Joe mm. sold Olds in 1970, because it was losing money. And then he sold it to those uh, the two members, Bud Danitz and Dave Sachs, and they tried to run it for almost two years and they had to sell it. It was losing money. Yeah. Ken, who has, you know, connections within literary and, and movie world, he understood the value of like, yeah, come on in, take photos, write the book, do it. Yes, go yeah. for it. He's ahead yeah. of his time with the marketing aspect for sure. Yeah. And he's like, if, if, if it, if it doesn't hit, it's no skin off my nose. I'm, I'm granting <laughs> you guys free access. And if it does hit, we all win. I think like Charles Gaines had said, it was on the bestseller list for more than a year. Yeah, it's, absolutely. It's, yeah, it's still in printing. And then they come back to do, they start filming the movie two years later. You know, because we, you know, we, we had gone down that road in some of the interviews, like we we're asking Ken Waller, Ken Spray, John Bay, like what if Ken didn't buy Golds and they had mm. to close it down and turn it into the antique shop, like Bud <laughs> and Sacks were going to do because yeah, yeah. they had to get their antiques off the ship. <laughs> and they said, okay, well, then where do the guys go train at that time? Do they drive into Pasadena to train at Bill Pearl's? Do they drive up to the Valley on Ventura Boulevard and train at Vince's? And is Vince the type of guy that's going to let someone come in and <laughs> set up movie cameras and shoot a movie? I don't yeah, think so. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And Bill Pearl is a kind, generous, wonderful man, but I don't know if he would have put up with that either the, i think those are the factors that propelled yeah interesting and uh you touched on the mr america parade now a lot of people don't know about it and even myself uh until watching your film kind of like it was very it was very pivotal to the time can you go into that a little bit more just to um inform people 
Yeah, it's, it, um, you know, I, I joined the the, uh, the gym and I think I think the year previous, there was like a little local TV show or, or it may have just been a segment on the local news on one of the three network affiliates, something about Gold's Gym. And since I'd already uh, more than a year prior had, had read Pumping Iron and now I was in the weight room, you know, I, I was more aware of that world. I was picking it up. And I'm like, wow, this 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 got to be a kind of a cool place. It's not that mm. far from where I'm at. I'll, I'll drive out and check it out. You started to see like little flyers or posters inside. It said, you know, um, you know, Gold's Gym, will, the, the sponsor for the 1977 AAU Mr. America. And it's going to be uh, the event of all time. I think a lot of the impetus, Ken had said, you know, the year prior in 1976, which in the United States of America was the bicentennial it was the 200th anniversary of the nation's birth. The Mr. The Mr. America contest was held in Philadelphia, which is the place of the Liberty Bell and the city of brotherly uh-huh. love. And it and he, and he said, and they dropped the promotional ball. It's like there was, you know, representatives from a few different muscle magazines. There was no, not even local TV coverage, no press coverage. He, I think that was part of where he says, I'm going to make this basically the greatest show on earth. And so he did. It was kind of interesting to see. Uh, how it came to fruition and then, you know, standing along Ocean Boulevard, you know, that day. And there's a lot of people that they were just showing up just to see what was going on. You know, there are, and then you see the elephants and the floats and the (laughs) band. I'm so glad that Wayne Gallish, you know, who would come to the States every year to, to film the big contest. And that is the only footage that exists other than the footage that is in the 60 minutes piece that ran. The yeah. ironic thing about the 60 minutes piece is that's actually footage from a production company that Ken Sprague hired to shoot. <laughs> um, and he said in one of, when he had, he had moved to Oregon after he sold golds uh, about a year or two later, he'd moved to the Northwest and he said certain things got lost in the move and, and I, oh, I could not man. find that film. So it does exist uh, in the CBS vaults, or some of it does, but they're going to charge you an arm and a leg to get it. <laughs> yeah, I know. I was just going to say, so speaking of kind of outtakes and lost footage, we know that Pumping Iron has that 100 hours somewhere sitting in Arnold's vault. Uh, how about in relation to your own project? Were there a lot of uh, good outtakes or just stuff that wouldn't couldn't fit or should be shoehorned into the film that uh, that you have sitting in your kind of like computer vault? <clears throat> Some of the stuff that you had in the review of my film, you know, like Arnold doing the side chest and the guy sitting around. But I spoke with uh, Dave McVeigh, who uh, him and his twin mm-hmm. brother actually yeah. worked on the, the Raw Iron Doc. And he had said, um, he goes, I'm not a bodybuilding fan. He says, but even from that perspective, he goes, there's hours and hours of footage of guys working out. Yeah. Um, there's nothing that really happens, you know, and, and <laughs> so that's, that, that's a lot. Exactly. <laughs> like, I mean, <laughs> yeah. I mean, th- there could be some really neat stuff for like fans yeah. that are, you know, deep dive fans watching whoever mm. work out together or some sort of exchange, but I didn't really, <clears throat> I would have loved to use some of it for B roll mm. um, just some of it, but I, I did find some other stuff. Yeah. What, what Dave, what David said is it, per, it was pretty, pretty much routine workout footage you can only yeah, see so yeah, much of that yeah, so. yeah and how about your own uh footage that you shot for this film is there a lot of out uh, outtakes that you have uh, perhaps that could contain uh, you know, some I, interesting gems I, I i do have well what i have is um you know with the interviews i had my cut of the film and i realized i really need to tighten it up to make the story flow and and uh i do have some wonderful conversation some bits of conversation from from all the guys um, mm. that, that, that I interviewed that just didn't make it. And I'll probably, um, you know, if this film does have a life and there's interest, then I will release some some outtakes because um, uh, Bill Grant and Pete Grimkowski alone spoke for close to two hours. And, oh, wow. <laughs> uh, yeah, and, and yeah, a yeah. lot of stuff. And, and, and all, all of the guys, all, all of yeah, the guys yeah. did speak. And I'm like, okay, that's a great story, but it doesn't necessarily – um, go with the flow of the movie, or I already have someone else saying kind of the same thing. So rather than have mm. four guys say the same thing, I'll just use one. Sure. Yeah. And I think the particular historical importance of your film is that, uh, you know, you've captured some of the perhaps last interviews of guys like Franco, Doug Brignoli, Rick Drayson, et cetera. We will never hear them speak again. So any of the footage that you've captured is actually extremely uh, important and valuable to all of us who love bodybuilding. Yeah. Well, th- thank you. And, and, um, yeah, I mean, um, uh, I, I, 
when Franco had passed, I didn't believe it. I, mm -hmm. I had gotten a couple of texts and I immediately text um, his assistant, Lynn Swanson, who set up the interview for me. She takes care of his, his business affairs. And she had texted me and she says, uh, no, we're, she goes, my husband and I are in Italy now. We've been at the hospital all day mm -hmm. and it's true. So, and that was almost a year to the day of when I interviewed him. Um, mm -hmm. When I went over to Rick Drayson's house to interview him, you know, ironically enough, I had just spoken to Doug and, and Rick's, Rick's health, he was, he was dealing with, with some issues. Um, mm. And, and Doug said, um, you know, uh, I can't remember if Rick had a, a knee rebuilt recently, or he had some sort of joint, uh, but the medic, uh, the, the, the medication was giving him some, you know, uh, some side effects or something. And, and, and mm. Doug said, I hope it hasn't caused some sort of systemic reaction. And then like about a year later, Rick had passed. And then of course, D D you know, Doug passing totally shocked me again. Um, oh, you know, my phone. Totally out of left field. Yeah. I mean, Doug, yeah. I mean, Doug and I first met at Bill Pearl's, you know, cause we're, mm. we're the same age and we went to um, competing high schools, you know, in, in, in the area. Um, mm. So, you know, to hear that he had passed, you know, it was, was a shocker and, and Doug, uh, as does Rick, as does Franco. Um, there's some great stuff that didn't make the make the film that that I yeah would, yeah want to get out uh, there. No, that's fantastic. Yeah, thanks for sharing whatever you have. Uh, you know, that's it's great. Um, if I can just take change uh, tack a little bit. Um, I first came across you in Randy Roach's uh, book, Muscle Smoke and Mirrors, the third volume, where you spoke, where he actually directly quoted you about uh, Arnold's comp competing in the 1980 Mr. Olympia. And I know that's like a favorite conversation or of debate. That's always, <laughs> that always crops up whenever we kind of talk about bodybuilding and Mr. Olympias. Um, so what was your opinion about the whole 1980s uh, controversy and debacle there? As someone that uh, saw it firsthand, of course. Yeah, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll qualify this. Uh, uh, the only reason I ever decided to lift and go to a gym beyond that was because of Arnold. You know, to me, and especially when I first became aware of him, number one, obviously, he didn't look like anyone else on the face of the planet, right? He was right. just, it was, yeah. yeah, it was, you know, <clears throat> just this amazing physique. But then he also had, um, he was like a combination of those cool 1970s anti-heroes from the cinema, <laughs> right? Yeah. The, the, the Steve McQueens, the Clint Eastwood. Yeah. Very good point. Um, the the Dennis Hopper, the Peter Fonda's, the guys that that were outside of, they were going to do it their way, mm -hmm. you know. They didn't mm -hmm. care. So he he had that persona combined with the muscle. It was it was yeah. like a whole new. It's like the James Dean of bodybuilding, almost in a way. Right. Yeah. He was just. It was like okay. Now we have to create another category for this guy. Yeah. Um, so I mean, and I think that's. I don't even know if anyone has even examined that aspect yet. Um, but, you know, having said that, when I, when I became a member of World and I was going between Golds and Worlds in 79, Arnold would come into the gym every morning. And I would be in the mornings depending on my school schedule. And so Arnold would come in very early and he had just, he would always run in the morning and then he would come in and he would do like a light circuit and then he would leave. And he was, um, <clears throat> I mean, he looked physically great in terms of normal people. You know, mm. I mean, he was he was tall, lean, very lean, mm. um, but his calves wouldn't go away and his biceps wouldn't go away. Yeah. But everything else, you know, you know, he, he was lanky, but <clears throat> he looked great. He looked healthy when he started getting a little bit larger, like like an 80. Um, I remember um, I mean, you could tell he was getting tan and and getting a bit larger, but still not competitive bodybuilding large. I mean, yeah, I mean, because yeah. I'm, you know, you're in that gym, you're looking and there's Calvin Scalic, there's Dennis Tenorino. Um, yeah. There's, you know, uh, Lance Jr. was there. There's Bob Reese. There's Samir. There's all these mm. guys. If Arnold walked on the street, people would say, oh, what a fantastic physique in the bodybuilding mm. world. You would say, um, okay, he's not quite there. And, and, yeah, yeah. Would come in. and I, I remember this distinctly, you know, I wish they had iPhones back then. <laughs> Eddie, you know, Eddie, Eddie, uh, uh, Giuliani. Yeah. Yeah. I remember there was these two guys that, that asked him, they said, you know, Arnold's looking, you know, he's starting to look really good. What, um, what, what would you say he is compared to his best? And Eddie says, hey, he's yeah. about 70%. He's about yeah. 70% <laughs> best, which I would, I would figure he was. 
Um, mm -hmm. And for those that say 70% of Arnold was better than the guys on stage, no. <laughs> no, I mean, because bodybuilding did not stand still between when he mm -hmm. retired in 75 and then he came back in 80. It's funny because no one, there were a few probably insiders that probably knew that he was going to enter, obviously. Um, but in terms of, of the gym, no. And so when the results had come back, and I remember, and, and I remember like looking at Eddie, uh, and they said, Eddie, you know, Arnold won. How did he look? And Eddie said, he looked fantastic. He looked <laughs> the best that he'd ever looked. And I looked at Eddie like, how can you say that? Yeah, you know, yeah. And he looked at me like, mm, you know, and, hey, <laughs> Just, he's, yeah. he's loyal to Arnold. If you read the magazine articles from the time, there was mm. there was a lot of controversy. And, and mm. from my perspective, not just in the physical perspective uh, uh, aspect of it, but just in terms of logic, no one in the normal world, the mainstream world, knows any bodybuilder. Frank Zane was a three-time defending champ outside mm. of like a, a token TV appearance or something or a commercial for Pabst Blue Ribbon. No one knows frank zane they mm. still talk about arnold um yes. arnold had done a couple of tv you know obviously he did pumping iron and stay hungry um he did um conan hadn't come out yet he may have he may have done a couple of tv movies but obviously his trajectory in a bodybuilding sense for what was going on in his private life was miles and miles and miles ahead of mm. the top guys in the sport i mean the the best that that you know, Frank Zane or Mike Mentzer or, or Robbie or some of the other guys could hope for is um, posing exhibitions, revenue, and, 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 and you're making your money that way. Um, Arnold had already transcended that by a long shot. Mm -hmm. So why does he come back? Yeah, yeah. He, no, it's... Back. he doesn't need to come back. And it's, <laughs> almost, it's almost like, you know, the motivation behind that, um, it, it made no sense because um, either you lose and um, you lose face, or if you mm. win, it's like, well, why'd you come back? You've already done yeah. it times, and you're like, you're, you're 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 having conversations with with movie producers now. You know, mm. these guys are still trying to sell their courses in the back of a Weeder magazine. There's, yeah. you know, what's the point? Um, the risk far outweighed the, outweighed the reward. I thought at the time, yeah, unless you really, there really kind of gambled on everything. Yeah, that's yeah. exactly yeah. unless there is. It's very. Risk. You know, as you probably know, the historical uh, co-timing of Arnold's uh, taking part in that contest also, you know, correlated with some other champion that was also making a comeback at it, almost like a day before, I think it was. Uh, yes. Which was, of course, Muhammad yeah. Ali. Muhammad. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, he couldn't control the variables as much as Arnold. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and you know, here, here's a little bit uh, a bit more of history is, is Muhammad Ali had a boxing gym on Main Street close to World Gym. Oh, wow. It was on, yeah. The, yeah, and it, and you would you would walk by. I walked by it hundreds of times and didn't even know it was there. It was <laughs> it was it was a very, you know, brown bag, just like any. And I think he wanted it that way because even though, you know, his boxing career was for the most part really over, his skills were diminished. Mm. He was still yet. I mean, the, one of the most famous people in the world, and would continue to be. Um, yes. So there's there's some of that. Um, but yeah, I always found like okay. And even for the prize money for the Olympia, it's like he 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 already owned property around Santa Monica. Yeah, purchased property um, elsewhere. It's like you you don't you don't need the. I don't even know what the prize money was for the Olympia. That five sure, I was dropping the bucket compared to what his weekly earnings would have been. Yeah, Ex exactly. I just got a um a text from a, a gentleman named Gary Colvin who. Um, help spread publicity and and um and he donated some money um to the doc and the gofundme but he's friends with barbara outland and uh, oh, yeah, well. he, yeah and he just sent me her her uh her take which is which is quite nice so there we go so we're talking about arnold and there's a text yeah. from, from barbara oh, so fantastic. um yeah so so you know randy i remember um i can't remember if it was a, it was an email and then we had a phone call and I, I, Randy and I must have spoke for, I would easily over two and a half hours the first time. Oh, wow. Yeah. And at the, t at the time, I, you know, to show you how long this has been going, uh, my film has been going on. At the time, I was considering making the movie. Uh, you know, we had spoke and he says, do you want me to mention your film in the book? And I said, well, at this point, Randy, I don't even know if it's going to get made. I don't. I, mm -hmm. It was just an idea in my head at that point. 
Sean. Sure, yeah. So that's when I spoke to him. But that's but seven uh, years ago, eight years ago. Yeah. 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 And and mm. uh, but his his research uh, was just fantastic. So so deep. And I said, you know, Randy, I go, I'm I'm saying things that that people probably would not even believe because in the modern world, everyone has a phone. And I said back then, if you had a video camera, it was this big and you were walking <laughs> yeah. around with it. Um, <laughs> You know, with all the conversations that were being said, the tenor in the gym after Arnold won was, uh, you know, very tense, a lot of bitterness. And if you think it was bad, the, the year after when Frank won, <laughs> it was the worst. Next level. Yeah, yeah. 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 It was even worse. You know, I have my theories as, as, as to how that went down too. You know, Randy did a wonderful job on it. Uh, yeah. 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 Again, why, why Arnold didn't need to compete. I mean, he, you know, and it's funny when people say, well, you know, he was going to do a movie, so you know, he needed the title. I'm like, a movie producer couldn't tell a Mr. Iowa from a Mr. Olympia, nor do they care. Arnold's Absolutely. their guy. Yeah, yeah. You know, he's, he has the track, the track record. He can be vouched for by Dino De Laurentiis, Bob Rafelson, yeah. Charles Gaines, George. You don't need another title. He had his resume already established, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And poor Mike, you know. Oh, well, you know, he was part of the, like, quote unquote, victims of the fallout, really. And oh. yeah, so. Yeah. Um, I, I noticed that you had mentioned in another interview that you had seen Mike train quite often at the gym. Um, I think like another uh, question of contention is, you know, Mike always espoused the heavy duty uh, program and principles that you know he collaborated with. I suppose with Arthur Jones. A lot of people sort of questioned whether he used those principles primarily to build his physique or did that come after his physique was already, uh, you know, well and truly established? What was your yeah. take on that? It came, it came after because, uh, you know, um, you know, Robbie Robinson and Mike were the two big emerging stars at Golds at the time that I was mm. there. And so, um, you know, Mike had Mike had the mic, you know, Joe, Joe, made, him, <laughs> Joe made him the, the editor in chief of Muscle Builder. Mm. And like Ken Sprague, he said, he goes, I think that Joe Weider lived vicariously through Mike. You know, they both yeah. wore glasses. Mm -hmm. They both had the mustache. Um, <laughs> and Mike point. was the, the physical embodiment of what Joe yeah. wanted to be. And, yeah, and he could have been the bust. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exa and then, then Mike, Mike had the, uh, uh, you know, the intellect, the intellectual aspirations that, that, mm -hmm. that Joe liked. Again, if you read those Mike Menser articles, he tells you in one of his articles that, um, you know, he grew up in Pennsylvania. Um, mm. He trained with a couple of local guys that were either power lifters or Olympic lifters. And that's how yes. he built his physique. Um, yeah. He built yeah. it with a traditional uh, volume approach. I, again, maybe a lot of people don't know um, to show you how talented and gifted in the muscle world Mike was. He was 19 years old when he yeah. placed 10th in the AAU Mr. America in 1971. Yeah. Incredible. 19, yeah. It was won that year by an 18 year old Casey. So, oh, wow. Yeah. I forgot. <laughs> on that stage were two of the most gifted, genetically gifted muscle freaks of all time. And mm. that's what made Arthur Jones a genius is let me get the genetic freaks to say they use my equipment and people will believe, you know, because I'm, I'm sure Casey was already, you know, Mr. America caliber at 17 when Arthur picked mm. him to train. Yeah. I mean, Mike was already fully formed by the time he got to golds in, in 75 because, you know, like, mm. as you point out, you know, he's there in the background when when uh, uh, when Arnold comes into the gym. Um <laughs> You know, he made treks west, and then in '77, when he stayed full time and was training in Santa Monica, he, again, he was already, you know, a national level competitor. So, mm. and I think at that point, he's like, uh, and I'm sure I, I wouldn't doubt that maybe my training is plateaued. I'm, I'm I've reached my potential. How else am I going to be able to tweak it? Uh, you know, when he started uh, espousing the Arthur stuff, which is just basically Arthur Jones pre-exhaust and uh and infrequent training yeah but he, that that's how he was i mean i would see him do a lot of warm-ups but his quote-unquote working set was definitely something that was s slow cadence intense, all out yeah. intense didn't arthur also have sergio training on on nautilus but you can't yeah. give this credit for sergio's physique because again exactly. he'd already been a three-time <laughs> mr olympia and an olympic lifter in cuba so yeah uh, yeah yeah it, it doesn't take too much you know, research to, to, to find out, I don't know, has, has Nautilus ever built a champ? I would, I would like to see them. Okay. Take someone from day one, use these training principles exclusively and let's see yes. what's rat in three years.
Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and by all accounts, I'm not sure of the veracity of this, but uh, didn't uh, Casey used to sneak out and, and sneak in some extra volume after the, <laughs> the high-intensity workouts? I don't know if that was true because I can imagine the high-intensity would be devastating. But Well, well you know, uh, uh, Pete Grimkowski, who was also down there, Pete was down in, in the land over over a time, as was, uh, I think, Roger Callard. He had a lot of guys mm. through there, even if they were just there for a couple weeks or something. And they both said the same thing. They're like, oh, yeah, KC would, you know, he'd have to get in. <laughs> uh, you know. That's great. I've never heard yeah. that confirmed. So, yeah, that's fantastic. Speaking of Mike, um, I get so many messages about, you know, can I do something on Mike Mensa? They want to see Mike Mensa. He seems to be, again, a very flavor of the month with the whole golden era resurgence and revival um i think you mentioned before that you have planned or you were looking at doing a documentary on mike because he's such a fascinating figure what's your thoughts on that still in a pure bodybuilding sense he would be a great subject i don't think it would have much appeal outside of that because i kind of thought yeah i I could i one it's interesting to me you're familiar with john little yes yeah he seems to be like the go-to guy for yeah yeah so I, i i think I believe John actually owns all of his intellectual property, but I don't know if that necessarily means it would clear the bar for fair use if someone else wanted to do a doc, you know, cause I, you know, I saw, I saw Mike 77 on, I know John showed up in Los Angeles from Canada, I think in 1980, you know, not, not that I knew Mike well, but he was friends with Dino who was Rudy Hermosillo's stepdad. I think I could tell the story. I don't know how interesting, how much more interesting it, it could be. It's, it's almost like I wouldn't, it's kind of a tragic uh, rise and fall, you mm. know, to, to me, because uh, he had so much potential, right? I mean, you know, yeah. smart, good-looking guy, fantastic physique, and then uh, it just became this descent. There was kind of a redemption at the end. But- and even still, he died so young, and then the, the yeah. tragic and coincidental passing of his brother as well, it seems. Yeah. It's just one of these bodybuilding bizarre coincidences that happens. It's, yeah, yeah. Kind of, you can't make the stuff up, you know. I know, I know, you but, can. <laughs> in fiction, no one will believe it. Um, in saying that, uh, you know, you've got this excellent film, and I just want to remind everybody again that they need to, you know, stop what they're doing and rush out and go and buy this film and support you in a way. Because, you know, if you're not watching these, um, you know, this documentary that you've created, I think you're really missing a large piece of the puzzle in your own kind of knowledge about bodybuilding history. It's just amazing. I, I really can't talk it up enough. But if you could snap your fingers, Mark, and uh, create an unlimited budget, unlimited access, all resources available at your fingertips project, what, what would you what would you tackle next? It could be bodybuilding or not. You, you know, I, I wish I could have done this one with an unlimited budget um, <laughs> yes. because the vision I had in my head versus what I had to settle for, uh, given the, the finances. I'm kicking around um, a Steve Mihalik, another oh, yeah. figure. And, and, and another, yeah. yeah, another polarizing figure, um, <laughs> and I and I would like I would like to um, to do something like that with with a bit more mm. resources because yeah, again, when you go back in time and and especially in a niche thing like bodybuilding, there's not a whole lot of footage. It's it's not like it, it was a traditional sport like football or baseball or basketball where you could just you know, find tons and tons of footage of, of past events, then it then it comes into having to do animations. And then to make yeah. it come really come alive, then you'd need a really good visual effects artist and after effects. And that, was su- that was a superb aspect. Sorry to interject, but that was a superb part of your documentary, how you got that uh, animated B-roll. Oh. I just love that. Like it oh. really, the Grimkowski stuff and all that was just brilliant. Like, well, thank you. I did, uh, my, my friend, I um, it was a big ask because... Mm. Uh, one, he's obviously he's a, is an excellent artist, and and as long as I've known him, whenever he tackles a project, I mean, he was in a rock band that was signed. He carves, he paints, he draws, huh. and so I know anything he does, he's going to go all out on. Yeah. So, and I knew how much time it was going to take, and yeah. with with really no guarantee of compensation, that was a big ask. And then when you know we would visit each other, he lives he lives down in uh, Solvang. Uh, which is uh, a little north of Santa Barbara. I live up in the Bay Area, so it's like a three and a half hour drive. And, you know, we'll visit each other. When I saw some of the the sketches, I felt even worse because they were penciled in full color, uh-huh. and and I'm like, oh my god, you're sending these scans to me, and they're in black and white. Uh-huh. I had no idea you took the time. He goes, it's just I just had to do it. He goes, but I know that it, it would scan better in black and white if it had more of the spectrum of color, which shows yeah. you the level of detail he went to. 
Oh, they're um, amazing. Yeah. 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 He's just fantastic. And I'm like, okay, I'm going to have to try and, you know, move them a little bit within the frame to, so they're not so static. I almost wanted to see an offshoot uh, animation series based on the characters yeah. that couldn't have any B-roll footage. That's how great they were. So yeah, maybe a future, uh, an idea for a, a documentary. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Those would be yeah. great. Yeah. yeah. The adventures of Pete and Tim on funny or die or something. It'd be uh, great. Brilliant. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I don't want to take too much more of your time, Mark. But I just want to say, uh, you know, again, I really implore everybody to go out and check out Mark's work. You can access it on the streaming sites that I've listed in my description, and I'll put that below as well. I just want to reiterate that it was such a sensational landmark historical document. A lot of the documentaries that we've seen come out over the years, particularly from the generation of Iron Flops, I didn't really enjoy them too much. Um, and just some of the other documentaries that have come along. Your film doesn't purport to be the sequel to Pumping Iron. But I think it definitely sits alongside Pumping Iron there in terms of the Thank historical you. quality and the commentary that you provide. I just think it was, an, you know, at the moment, maybe like an underrated work. But I think with everyone checking it out, we can really boost the popularity and get the name of, of it out there. So I can only thank you, man. It's it's fantastic honor to have you on. Well, th thank you, and 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 thank thanks for any sort of public boost and and caring about it. I am. Um, I hope that it has value outside of even the bodybuilding world, just in terms yeah. of like sociological, you know, for people that are just history buffs of, of whatever it's like, Hey, this is what Southern California was like in the seventies. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, I've never seen a documentary that. like that before. Yeah. Covering that period. Even my yeah. uh, partner who watched it, she, um, as a lay person, you know, she's got a peripheral interest in the sport, but yeah. she learned so much and said it was so entertaining, kept her riveted for the entire time. So. Oh, good, good. Well, thank you. This has been great, Sean, and thanks, and thanks for putting up with my dogs going uh, in. No, not at all. <laughs> but uh, thanks very much again for your time. I appreciate it, and uh, hopefully we'll talk again sometime soon. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks again. Thanks for, thanks for your time. Bye. Thank you.